Prime Time. From New York, Diane Sawyer. Good evening. Back in the 1960s, black Americans were promised that this country would no longer judge people by the color of their skin. Tonight, nearly 30 years later, we bring you the results of a primetime investigation. We started this by going to the Leadership Council for Open Metropolitan Communities in Chicago. It's a group that tests for fair housing. We asked them to give us two testers trained in presenting themselves exactly the same way. Two young men who could go into white and racially mixed neighborhoods with hidden cameras to record their experiences for us. During the two and a half weeks, at times the two men were treated equally, at times there was ambiguity. But tonight, we're going to show you some of the ways in which they were treated differently. Because this didn't happen just once or twice, it happened every single day. Meet John Kunin and Glenn Brewer. They work together at the Leadership Council. They're both from the Midwest. They went to Big Ten schools, grew up in middle-class families. Even play on the same softball team. They're friends. Two young men whose lives are virtually the same in every way but one. The one you can see. A few months ago, John and Glenn agreed to pack their bags and help with our investigation. Our question, how much difference does the color of your skin make in everyday life in America? For the answer, we went to the city of St. Louis, Missouri, where the two men moved into this motel and prepared to begin a new life. You really feel that you're, that you're equal. Definitely. Yes. One, two, three, four. Ch the twist? Okay, so. Every day we'll be with them to show you what happens. Set. Set. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let us tell you a little bit about how we're going to go about this. We're going to send John and Glenn into a variety of situations, and we're going to monitor what's going on from the van. We'll be parked outside. One of the first things John and Glenn do is take a look around the city, go to a shopping center to pick up some things they need. John looks at some clothes. So does Glenn. They do some browsing, and right away, something catches our attention. When John walks up to this electronics counter, he gets almost instant service. But just a few minutes later, when Glenn walks up, he is ignored by not one, but two salesmen standing a few feet away. We didn't make anything of it until it happened again and again. In the shoe department at this store, John gets instant attention and a hearty welcome. <laughs> Yet when Glenn walks in just three minutes later, the salesman looks away. We run a stopwatch as the salesman continues to stare past Glenn. No hearty welcome for him. I was standing there and standing there and standing there. And John just barely skirts the fringe of the department. And the guy comes over and he's joking, he's laughing. And that did not happen for me. Even when the two men stroll into a nearby car dealership, Glenn walks up to a new car right in front of the showroom window. Once again, we run the clock. I walked around the car, kicked the tires, looked under the rear at the muffler. It seemed an enormous amount of time to me to stand there and wait uh, for me to spend my money. So you're clear that they knew you were there? Yes. There was a black salesman who looked at me and then looked away. A black salesman. The same salesman who was there in an instant, the moment John set foot on the lot. If we can work it out for you, what do I have to do to earn your business? Sign your shoes. <laughs> what about that? What about that salesman? Julianne Malvo and Clifford Alexander both study the social and economic consequences of race in America. She's an economist at Berkeley. He's a consultant and former secretary of the Army. His life lesson is the same life lesson that the white salesman got, that this is a group of people that, for some reason, I should deal with differently, despite the fact that I might make some money from them. That different treatment became apparent in another way when our two testers went to a record store. John browses quietly. So does Glenn. That's him in the background. But now, watch the salesman approaching from the left. He stops next to Glenn. He's not offering to help him. He's tailing him. And when I moved, he moved. And I think after about the second or third time when that happened, it suddenly dawned on me 
He is there strictly to follow me around. I was surprised to see him trailing Glenn uh, in the shop because it, 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 he wasn't trailing me. This salesman who followed Glenn around in that store, men like that would say to you, I'm, this is not racist behavior. Black people commit more crime as a percentage of population. That's why I followed him. Do you think that all 32 million black people should be judged by some statistic about crime in this society. No, but the okay. question that's is, it, how, that's, what that's kind right. of blame do we put on I this person? I rest my case. I rest my case. It I'm isn't a question of blaming the white person following. It's a question of understanding why he follows. If this man had behaved suspiciously, if he had picked up something, put it down, perhaps put it toward his pocket, that would be one thing. He was browsing. Nearly every day or night, someone treated Glenn like an outsider. For instance, one day, we locked the two men out of their cars, 40 feet away from each other. Glenn struggles all alone to get into his car. John, on the other hand, has a small crowd of passers-by, offering information and help. If you call the police, they'll clean up for you. Everybody who came by in my car, it seemed, had something to say to me. And you? Nothing. No help, no one. One night, John and Glenn go for a walk in downtown St. Louis, one just ahead of the other. But when a police car passes by, it's Glenn who gets the pointed once over. When he got to where John was, he rolled right by John. But he stopped and leaned out the window just to inspect you. Yes. And on another night, walking on a residential street in white South St. Louis, a truck slows down next to Glenn. Our microphone picks up the man leaning out and telling Glenn he's in the wrong neighborhood. Go far south, man. Okay. The implication there was we were not where we were supposed to be. Which is in the north part of St. Louis as far as he was concerned. Yes. So you're constantly doing this calculus of what am I going to do about this? Am I going to tell him to shove it? Am I just going to walk on by? Do I have the time, the energy? What is the cumulative effect of it? How bad is this day in and day out? It's the harmless kind of racism that if you accuse someone of it, they would say, well, gee, that's not cross-burning, and yet it still grinds exceedingly small. Every day, John and Glenn keep diaries, and the grinding is clear when we stop to ask about those impressions. You think you could make it here, no problem? Yeah, I think that I, uh, that I could make it here and, and set up here if I wanted. Knowing what has happened to me, I think I would be fairly discouraged. At this point, already? Yes. An emotional price is one thing. It's still another when the price is money out of your pocket. At a car dealership, John was told he could get a car for almost nothing down. Financing available? Glenn's told he'll need at least $2,000 down. Was it just a fluke? They try a second lot. They decide to ask about the same red convertible with the same salesman. First, how much of a down payment will be needed? What do they usually ask down? Uh, anywhere from 10 to 20%. You know, it just depends, sure. Well, normally the banks want anywhere from 20 to 25%. So you're looking at, yeah, you're looking at a couple grand there. Already, John's advantage is as much as $1,000. And what about the price of the car? You could probably pick it up for somewhere around the nine range. Nine? I mean, if I could get you in the car for, say, 95 even, I think you'd be interested. Once again, a big difference. Since we heard all of this from the van, we decided to get out and see if we could get some answers. The manager met us first. What do we got today? Can we talk to John Novak? And then that salesman appeared, and we asked him why John and Glenn were quoted different figures. Well, they're all different. It just what? depends. Two guys come in looking at the same car. What's the difference? For him, the banks will do 10 to 20. For him, 20, 25. What's the difference? Depends on the vehicle, ma'am. Well, they're looking at the same vehicle. Oh, OK. What's the difference? We never did get an answer. Is there a difference? And we're not the only ones asking that question. Experts say car salesmen consistently regard blacks as less sophisticated customers and try to make them pay more. The result, according to a national study, black Americans pay twice the markup that whites do, at a cost of more than $150 million a year. And another way African Americans pay for the color of their skin is job discrimination. Over several days, John and Glenn apply for all kinds of jobs. 
signing up for job services, answering the want ads.